On behalf of the World Affairs Council, I'm Carla Thorson. I'm your moderator this evening. And it's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's guest. Janine Zakaria is the Carlos Kelly McClatchy Visiting Lecturer at Stanford University. From 2009 to 2011, she was Jerusalem Bureau Chief and Middle East Correspondent for the Washington Post, during which time she reported from Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza, as well as widely throughout the Middle East. She previously served as Chief Diplomatic Correspondent for Bloomberg News, Washington Post Bureau Chief for the Jerusalem Post, and has worked for various news outlets in Jerusalem, including the Reuters News Agency. So please join me in welcoming Janine Zakaria for a conversation tonight about the conflict in Gaza and what comes next. I want to thank Carla and the, and the World Affairs Council for inviting me. Um, I think the title of the talk was something like Israel and Gaza, what comes next? But I think before we talk about what comes next, we're going to have to look back a little bit about how we got here, all right? And I have a couple of objectives for tonight. Um, and the main objective, though, is I want you to come away from this talk maybe feeling a little bit more enlightened on the subject and maybe getting some of your own questions answered as we've watched this um, horrific month of hostilities, right? And so I want to leave as much time for Q&A as possible. But just to tick off a couple of things I want to try and get to either in the formal remarks or in the Q&A is I want to give the relative context for the recent explosion in violence. And anytime you try and do that, it can get sort of uh, political and all that. You know, she's only emphasizing certain things or other things. But I'm just going to try and identify it, especially for people who don't follow this subject on a day-to-day -day basis but are sort of curious about, you know, what the, who the main actors are and, and how we got to now in Gaza. Um, I want to talk about internally on each side what they hope to achieve here, um, what gains may have been made, and of course the losses which are um, the, the, the most of what we saw on the ledger here. Uh, Carl asked me to talk about prospects for uh, future peace talks. On that part I'll be brief. Um, I want to talk about um, the impact that this had, uh, or is the way that uh, the Israel-U.S. alliance has been impacted by all that. I think that's probably a subject. How many people want to hear about that? All right. I figured some people want to hear about that. So I have a lot to say about um, the tensions that we've seen growing between President Obama and Prime Minister Netanyahu um, and where we are now, which I think is pretty much a low point in the relationship. Uh, especially today. I don't know how many people saw the Wall Street Journal today, but there was a, a blockbuster scoop there, which I'll refer to. I'm imagining there's some interest in the media coverage of the war. Uh, how many people want to hear about that? All right. I saw you. All right. So we'll talk about the media coverage. I might get at it a little different way than you expect, but we're going to talk about that, about all this. And throughout all this, I want us to try and answer a question that I ask all of my Stanford journalism students to think about anytime they turn in a story to me which is namely, what is new here, right? What's different about this war than previous wars that we've seen, right? So that's a lot to cover in 20 minutes of prepared remarks. But those of you who have seen me speak before know that I speak quite quickly um, because I'm from Long Island. But <laughs> nevertheless, I'm going to try and slow it down because some of it is complicated. If you remember anything from tonight, this is the main, thing, main point I want to make. Everybody has a tendency to want to look at uh, Israel started this because they wanted this, or Hamas started this because they wanted this, or Mahmoud Abbas wanted this. Don't assume that there's that much premeditation and intention in all the events we've seen here. In a lot of cases of foreign policy, I, mean, I think we're seeing this in a broader scale right now, things happen, and I think in this case in particular, what we've seen over the last couple of years and manifesting now is there's a lot of reactionary policy going on a lot of tactical moves that are not necessarily part of some well-thought-out strategy. So when we're looking for answers, all we can do is give our best assessment, really, of what happened. So let's start right now in the present, OK? Uh, thankfully, right now, today, as we're talking, we're in a period of relative calm. You've got these sort of halting ceasefire negotiations going on uh, to try and put an end to this 30-day conflict. Um, and you've got Israel and Hamas essentially negotiating, right, an end to this, 
um, in Egypt with an Egypt Egyptian mediator. And if I don't get to it, someone asked me about Egypt, okay, because it's a very important part of the story, okay, and, and what's going on there and why I think we're one of the main reasons we're struggling to get a ceasefire is because of the changes in Egypt, right? And that the one leader, I'll say it now anyway, I said, we'll get to it later, but I got to just make the point off the bat because the ceasefire is struggling right now. And you might be saying, why can't they get a ceasefire, right? The main reason is because the main person who has leverage over Hamas, the main Egyptian, his name is Mohammed Morsi from the Muslim Brotherhood, and he's in jail. And you've got President Sisi, who does not have the kind of influence over Hamas that Morsi had. So, but we'll get to that a little bit later. So the ceasefire, they're struggling, they're trying to get it. And the irony is that Israel wanted to avoid negotiating with Hamas. And yet here they are sort of indirectly, I guess they're in separate rooms in some Cairo hotel, but they are negotiating. And what's different here about previous ceasefire negotiations is that they're talking about more than just a ceasefire. They're, they're trying to talk about some sort of long-term truce. Now, I'm not optimistic they're going to get there, and we'll wrap with why I'm not optimistic about that, but that is significant. We'll talk more about that, okay? Now, how did we get here? Let's talk about the macro story, okay? Exactly nine years ago today, I was thinking about it in the ride up here. Nine years ago today, I was in the Gaza Strip reporting for Bloomberg News at the time, watching Israel withdraw from the Gaza Strip. They withdrew 8,000 Jewish settlers, um, and they pretty much just pulled them out, pulled them off rooftops. I watched Jewish settlers throwing pans at Israeli soldiers because they didn't want to leave. It was a very kind of uh, very intense moment in the country. Ariel Sharon uh, was the prime minister. He was leading this evacuation um, because he decided that peace talks were not going to work with the Palestinians, and he decided he was going to take unilateral action, withdraw from the Gaza Strip, and with uh, some settlements, at least in an initial phase, from the West Bank. So he withdrew from the Gaza Strip, um, but they, Israel still maintained control of the entry and exit points, um, which will be relevant in our, in our backdrop here, right? Um, Ariel Sharon then goes into a coma and eventually dies uh, more recently, but that sort of forestall, it was over, the kind of, we didn't know where, we, we didn't know how that story was going to end. Um, and so now Gaza is evacuated, you have Palestinian elections, right, in 2006, Hamas wins in a surprise. Condoleezza Rice is on the treadmill when she sees the ticker on CNN saying Hamas won the election, and she recalls that she nearly fell off the treadmill because she was watching this in shock. We were very, the U.S. was blindsided by the result. There's a power struggle. Hamas seizes control of this strip of territory in 2007, okay? This is when Israel imposes or strengthens this blockade that, that is relevant now around the Gaza Strip, okay? Because they don't want Hamas, a designated terrorist organization, being able to uh, import weapons and other things. You have this little incident in 2010. I'm just giving you the highlights here, okay, or the lowlights. Um, of the a Turkish aid flotilla trying to get to the Gaza Strip. How many people remember this? Turkish aid flotilla, I'm now in, Drew I'm in Gaza when this happens, actually, uh, when this flotilla is coming. Uh, and Israel kills nine Turks aboard the ship in a, when there's a, lot of, uh, a confrontation aboard the ship. Now, well, the reason I bring up this point in this series of events is because this is a moment that I'm identifying as one of um, perhaps missed opportunities for us to, for Israel and the Palestinians to maybe have come up with some new strategy on Gaza. Because shortly before that flotilla incident, I went to meet with a senior Israeli official and I, I asked him to explain Israel's Gaza policy to me. And he said to me in Hebrew, Mat lo mevina, what don't you understand? Like he didn't understand why I didn't understand it. And I said, I don't understand it because you've had this blockade, Hamas is still in power. Uh, I don't see it achieving a goal. Hamas is, you know, in some ways getting stronger even, right? They've got their smuggling tunnels, they're getting money. But for Israel, they didn't really see any other alternative, right? In 2010, I think there might have been a moment after that flotilla incident to rally the international community um, around the issue of Hamas, the weapons, and the issues that are in play right now. After that, so then even before that, you had, of course, the, the cast led major three, three wars basically in the last six years, 2008, 2012, and now this year, right? So that's sort of the main events in the macro. In the micro, um, and what I mean in the micro is sort of just the proximate events that led to maybe this latest flare-up, okay? And this is, I don't want to dwell on this too long because people say, well, it's actually this that caused this. I'm just going to give you a couple things, all right? 
John Kerry. Poor John Kerry, right? He tried so hard. He was working this issue. And if he had, ha if he had succeeded, that would have been news, right? That he failed was really not a surprise in being able to um, get some sort of a peace agreement or at least a statement of principles that they could have built upon. His peace effort collapses um, around the time that there is an announcement that the Palestinian Authority, Fatah Party, and Hamas are unifying after seven years of sort of a seven-year breakup. Um, and this is not a move that is welcomed by Israel, to say the least. Prime Minister Netanyahu um, accuses the Palestinian president of supporting terrorism by unifying with Hamas. It's kind of pretty much, that's it, for the peace effort, for the unity government, no, Israel's not interested. And then on June 12th, three Israeli teenagers are kidnapped in the West Bank. Now, this was a pivotal moment in, in all of this uh, for many reasons. Israel accuses the Hamas leadership in Gaza Strip of orchestrating this kidnapping, and until this day, it's still not clear whether or not they were actually behind the kidnapping. You have mixed commentary coming from um, Israeli security officials about whether they were behind it. Now, Prime Minister Netanyahu had a few options when that, ha when that incident happened, okay? And the option he, he chose was to send um, thousands of Israeli soldiers into the West Bank to try and find them. And in the process, um, there were a lot of, um, a lot of house demolitions. Um, a lot of, about 500 Palestinians were arrested, including, and this is the key point, 50 members of Hamas who had been released very recently as part of a prisoner release deal, okay? So this was very irritating to, I think, the Hamas leadership in the Gaza Strip. Now, some people will say, Janine, you're wrong. That's not what caused Hamas to fire rockets, and we can talk about that in the Q&A, but I think it was definitely a contributing factor. There were other contributing factors, which may, many of you may have read about, about why Hamas might have started to fire rockets, including the fact that they were feeling isolated, pinched financially, uh, and other reasons, and that they wanted to sort of reassert themselves. But I do think that um, the Israeli operation to try and find the three kidnapped teens um, who were later found dead on June 30th, um, that that was something that definitely amped up tensions, to say the least. Um, and of course, on July 8th, amid some Hamas rocket fire, Israel launches its operation to stop that. A week and a half later, they begin the ground offensive. Um, and the mission uh, that Israel has moves from stopping the rocket fire to going after um, a network of underground tunnels that Hamas had built, right? Um, both along the border to penetrate into Israel and also within Gaza to give Hamas militants some ability to move around um, undetected. And this surprised me as someone who's watched this for a while. I did not think he was going to choose uh, the ground option, and I did not expect him to call up 86,000 reservists, which is an enormous number in a country like Israel. Uh, and in a piece I wrote for the Washington Post, which I don't know if some of you might have been able to see, I argued that in a way this was a bit opportunistic on Netanyahu's part because I think the tunnels were a problem that he wanted to deal with, um, and he, he saw that there was support for a war uh, right now um, or a strong military offensive against Hamas, and he was able to mobilize an extraordinary number of Israelis behind it. In fact, there was very little dissension in Israel at all um, to anything that uh, the Israel Defense Forces did uh, during this. I don't remember a time really in recent memory when Israel was so united behind um, the prime minister or a military offensive. I mean, one of the last wars that I covered was the 2006 war with Lebanon, with Hezbollah in South Lebanon. And I think from the moment that war started, which also began with a kidnapping in a way, um, it was uh, people were yelling at about Ehud Olmert's incompetence and what are we doing? And, and there was, just wasn't the kind of same backing that, there, that you saw now. Um, and it's, it's interesting to, to talk about, um, I think, and maybe I'll just I'll, I'll talk as well, this is an important point, I think, and something I wrote about uh, as well over the last month, is the way that Israelis saw this conflict and the way the world saw it were very different. It was almost as if uh, they were watching two different wars. I don't know if any of you felt that way. 
Um, but I spent a lot of time uh, sort of watching Israeli media coverage, what they were watching on TV, what they were reading. And there was this feeling, uh, which you see often in, in wartime, but of, of, of the media sort of rallying around this. There wasn't as much uh, on, the, on television about uh, Palestinian casualties or the extent of the damage. It was a, a very limited picture. And there was an enormous amount of lamenting in the Israeli media about why the world doesn't see it the way we do. Why don't they understand that we are um, being attacked by a terrorist entity in the Gaza Strip and we are retaliating within our rights? Like, why don't they see it our way, right? And then this, of course, led to a lot of attacks on, on the foreign media for, for fueling what they thought was this, what this misperception. Meanwhile, the rest of the world is sort of watching something else, right? And they're watching... Um, uh, enormous uh, number of casualties on the Palestinian side, and um, I think the total now is around uh, 1,900 Palestinians killed and 67 Israelis, 64 soldiers uh, out of the 67, which again, 64 soldiers in Israel, I mean, I just, you can't, 64, I'm not talking about the numbers, but 64 soldiers in Israel is an enormous toll, and still the country was behind it, right? Um, and the 1,900 casualties, even by Israel's own uh, estimations, um, probably around 1,000 of those are civilians. Um, anyway, so you had an enormous toll. And what we're going to see coming next, I think, in the coming, if not minutes, then days and weeks, the focus, if they get this ceasefire, and again, that's a, a real lasting one, that's, or a truce, which is a big if, is we're gonna, people are going to turn to the investigations after the fact of both internally Israel will be conducting investigations, and I think the investigations will be more about what did we know about the tunnels, why didn't we stop it, how did we let that, you know, what happened here. Um, and there will be some investigations about uh, internal inquiries, at least, about the way the IDF operated. Um, but you'll, you'll have um, the UN Human Rights Council looking at um, whether or not Israel committed war crimes in this and that's already out there, and, and Netanyahu was talking about it today, telling the Human Rights Council that they had nothing to look for in Israel. They should go to Tripoli, Damascus, and I forgot the third place. Was it, does anybody remember? Anyway, so uh, he's not, there's, it's unlikely that you're going to have a uh, normal, it's, it's a sort of a, re that's something that's very similar to what we saw in 2008, 2009, right, when you had the Goldstone Report that came out, which, um, accused both sides in the end of committing war crimes. Um, so, I mean, that's sort of what's coming down the pike. Now, I said, just want to touch on, we're gonna, I'm just giving you like teasers, all right? And then we could go in the, in the Q&A and in, in, in depth into any of this. But there was an interesting piece in the New York Times, I think, talking about how this all might lead to peace talks. I didn't really follow the logic. Um, I think what's interesting here is the best, and I always, when I give these talks, it's always so negative and depressing. But one possible outcome, maybe, is that it's true that President Abbas, um, that Israel's real, if, if a few, two months ago they were talking about him as a, a terrorist conspirator by doing a national unity government with Hamas, now he's the go-to guy again, right? And Israel realizes they need him in this negotiation that's going on in Egypt. So maybe there would be, that he would be um, bolstered by all this, but I'm not really sure. Um, so I'm not betting on resumption of peace talks. Anybody betting? I don't know. The other problem, of course, even if you, I mean, maybe if everybody was interested, I just don't see the interests on both sides. And the US is completely checked out on this right now in terms of trying to broker anything. So I'm not optimistic. Um, let's just talk a minute about US-Israel, and then we'll, we can talk about it more in the Q&A. It's quite extraordinary what we're seeing, right? I mean, I've, I've covered a lot of um, disputes over the years between the United States and Israel, but I don't remember it quite this bad. Um, and until today, I was saying, well, okay, so Obama and Bibi don't like each other. Um, the Israelis can't say enough bad words about John Kerry. I mean, they're, they're cursing at him in every language, Yiddish, Hebrew. I mean, they're, they're really painting a picture of him as, I mean, one of the writers called him a, a, a helpless nebach, which is like a, a in nebish, it's, it's nebish, but nebach is like the Hebrew uh, accented version of nebish. He's kind of like, like just like a hopeless 
creature. I don't know how to expl really translate it well, but I mean, they really went after him. And so that, that already uh, upset President Obama. And then, you know, leaking phone calls. I mean, there was just, it's, it's very curious about why Israel would be picking a fight or, 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 or at least airing the dirty laundry at a moment of complete dependence on the United States. Right? I mean, this is, a, this is the key question that I uh, keep, keep coming back to, why, and, and, then I, and then I get asked, right, why would they do that right now when literally the United States has helped envelop Israel in a blanket of, 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 of kind of virtual security with this Iron Dome, right? And, and maybe if you're upset with Obama, you would do it in private, but it's just, it's, it's gotten to the point where they can't help but, 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 but fight publicly. And I think anybody who cares about Israel should be very worried about this, um, the, the, this, this gap that you're seeing. And I mean, just, I remember uh, I was going to do a TV appearance about a week ago on all this, and uh, someone put in their, in my Twitter feed, in Hebrew, they wrote, only two more years of Hussein Obama, and then we're done with him. And that, I think, is emblematic of the feeling that uh, every man on the street in Israel, too, they, they feel that, that President Obama does not have their back. So this is, I think, quite frustrating for the president. We could go through some of the, the fights they've had. But today is when it really mattered. Because if this Wall Street Journal story was true, and I think it is, that the White House decided to block um, an arms shipment to Israel, uh, that's when you get the Israelis' attention. Then they're gonna, they're gonna, now they're going to pay attention. You had a similar case back in 2000 when I was working in Washington when Israel really pushed the United States um, over a, an arms, Israel was trying to sell an arms system to China, and a lot of people in Washington got upset about that, and some of Israel's strongest allies on the hill, Capitol Hill, actually blocked an, uh, a helicopter, Apache helicopter shipment to Israel, and that's when Israel canceled this controversial deal. So I think, keep your eye on this story over the next couple days. It's going to be something that um, is really going to be out there. I think the White House, according to the story, said it wants to review each arms transfer to Israel. So this in the, you know, right now. So that's not that's not common protocol, okay? So that's I mean gives you a sense of of where we're at and again, we can talk more about that. Um, I think maybe I'll save the media coverage for the um, the Q&A part to see what you really want to talk about and just just end with a couple my formal part with just a couple of couple observations in general, okay? Here's my take, all right? And it's just my take. Israel is the mightiest military in the region, okay? But they cannot solve this Gaza problem militarily. That's the takeaway, okay? They want to, they want to be able to. They want to say that they are the most um, moral um, army and that they're doing their best to prevent civilian casualties, but something very different just happened, okay? And I think the frustration that Israelis are feeling um, is that they couldn't solve it militarily. When that, on, in early August, a couple of weeks, uh, what is it, what were we at, 14th? So I think it was August 1st or 2nd when you had a tentative ceasefire um, agreed to. Israel was supposed to be able to continue demolishing tunnels and Hamas didn't get the memo, all right? And they kidnapped, they killed a couple of Israeli soldiers and they thought that one Israeli soldier was kidnapped. So this, this kidnappings in Israel really rattle Israelis, it really rattle them, rattle them. Um, the Israeli uh, media were saying, we've got to continue with this. We've got to finish this m tunnel destruction mission. I mean, everybody, they just wanted to seize this military. They want the military option so badly to work. But even if they got 36 tunnels, all right, and even if they got, I don't know, 10,000 rockets and however many were fired, and they're still, they're still going to have more rockets, and there's still going to be more tunnels, and there's still going to be problems, and it's... And I just did this whole idea that's been in the press that Israel thinks it can mow the grass every couple of years, as they've been doing, and go in there militarily, diminish Hamas's capabilities. It's not sustainable. I don't think it's sustainable. Now, you argue maybe it's sustainable, but I don't think it's sustainable. I think in the aftermath of this, another point I want to make is that uh, maybe this is obvious that... Um, you know, Israel keeps trying to say that, you know, Hamas brought this upon themselves and the human shields and all these arguments, but Israeli isolation is deepening, okay? It's deepening as a result. So again, if you care about Israel, you should be worried about this, okay? Um, again, Egypt, I think, is a main factor here. Like I mentioned, it's not getting explained very well in the press, but the fact that 
you don't have a strong Egypt right now, and you have General Sisi trying to play the role that Hosni Mubarak and later Mohamed Morsi played is one of the reasons we're not getting a deal. Who, uh, there's nobody who's, who's need, who can mediate, who's left, right? Um, the two-state solution, uh, you know, I don't know. Let's talk about it in the Q&A. We're not going to solve it tonight, I'm sure. But, I mean, I, I'm not giving up yet, but it, it does, it's not looking good. And, um, and, we'll, and the, the media thing, I'm gonna, I was going to save my final conclusion on that in case someone asked about it. So I'm going to pause here and let, let Carla ask some questions. Thanks. So as you can see, I have, I have a lot of questions. I'm trying to sort them into issue areas here. We'll try to get to all of them so in 27 I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you what issue areas I have, and then if you have other questions about other things, now's your chance to write them. So I think there are some questions about tactics and strategy, and also what the situation on the ground in Gaza is like. Uh, there are questions about the Palestinian leadership dynamics. Um, Egypt and the role of Egypt in all of this, uh, questions about the media and the way in which coverage of the conflict it is managed or not, the role of the U.S., U.N., and also world opinion more broadly, and then lastly, the sort of larger regional dynamics in which this conflict is taking place. So that's the range that I have, and I'm going to try and tackle them a bit in order. Um, I think you actually answered this one, but just at the very end here, but I'll just go ahead and give it to you. Um, I'll give you a couple. So Israel, Israeli leaders have set the demil demilitarization of Gaza as one of their goals. Under what, if any, conditions would Hamas agree to this? Thank you. Um, on the other side of the do you table. Wanna, do you want me to take it or we'll bundle them? Well, I'm going to give you the, okay. the, the second one because I think you might want to okay. address this as well. Um, more interestingly, after this current round of conflict is over, will there be any serious attempt to rebuild Gaza by addressing the extreme poverty and unemployment? Okay. So to get Hamas to give up, to demilitarize, is, 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 a, is a challenge, right? And um, obviously. Um, but you've had, um, in the middle of the war even, um, a former Israeli army chief of staff, Shaul Mofaz, and he's no dove, saying, let's do this demilitarization for development idea. Let's try and get, like, $50 billion to develop Gaza. Hamas will be seen as, you know, Victor. They'll have to partner with Fatah, and maybe they'll manage this, and um, let's do that. And in, a, and in a way, this has now become the... Uh, I think the approach that Prime Minister Netanyahu is supporting, I don't see any objection in the international community to that, frankly. Um, so I think that, that maybe if Hamas can get something out of this, you know, from my experience reporting, and this sort of segues a little bit in the issue of what it's like there, when I would meet, I would interview um, Hamas politicians, I mean, the, the political wing, and there's the military wing and the political wing, and they, this was not your Hamas of like, these guys were not the same Hamas that I covered in the 90s. Right when they were when they were like only blowing up pizzerias and buses in Jerusalem when I lived there, right? It was they were these guys were like in ties meeting with Norwegian diplomats. They wanted to be accept. They wanted something. There's something they want. They want this political recognition. So I think that there is ways to get at this creatively. Um, and you know, and some I mean at least ostensibly that what they're talking about right now is letting the fishermen. Uh, fish a few more miles out. I mean, there are things you can give. But the problem is that Israel doesn't want it to look like Hamas got a victory here. A lot of this is a perception problem. It's not a functional problem, right? You can, why can't you let the fishermen fish three miles out? The Israeli Navy's there, right? Why can't you have an international inspection regime that uh, you know, monitors the imports if you have a, 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 a new port? and a, you know, When I was there, is pa Palestinians in Gaza complained more about where they couldn't go more than, you know, what they couldn't acquire in Gaza. So, rebuild Gaza. Let's hope, right? I mean, well, someone's they have to rebuild Gaza. I mean, look what look what's happened. It's going to have to happen one or the other. Yeah. Okay. So next question was about the seaport. You just addressed that one, so I'm going to set that one aside. The seaport needs help. I mean, when I was there in 2010, just quickly, they were waiting for that ship, right? The flotilla. And I was in the hotel, uh, and I was watching, literally, 
uh, Palestinians in like their, their pants rolled up trying to dig out the silt or whatever the, what do you call it the dirt under the water right there so that the port so that this big ship of aid would be able to dock there was no place to dock I mean if I said if that ship doesn't make it it's because it can't dock I didn't think there was gonna be a military operation but anyway so they need a there is no port right now yeah hmm. okay here are a couple so can you speak to the issue of divided leadership between Gaza and the West Bank and how it affects their ability to negotiate with the Israelis? That's a good um, question. Similarly, what is the likelihood of increased Palestinian authority control of Gaza? Okay, important questions. The divided leadership is, is, a, is a major problem, right? It's been a major problem for the peace talks um, because, uh, see if you can follow, okay? Israel says it can't negotiate with them when they're divided because Mahmoud Abbas from Fatah doesn't represent Hamas, right, all the Palestinians, right? There's two, nearly two million in Gaza, right? He only represents the West Bank. So how are we going to do a deal with him when he doesn't represent everybody? But then when they united, Israel can't negotiate with them because Hamas is a terrorist organization, right? So either way, there was, it was problematic. So, uh, you know, one way to, to say the least, right? I mean... And Israel wants, you know, Hamas to say, we're not going to destroy you. I think that's a reasonable request, right? We're, we're, not, we're not calling for your destruction. But Hamas is not going to say that unless that's part of their, they think that's part of their negotiating, right? Um, so I think divided leadership is a problem. But then you had a, a shot here at the unity government. I was trying to research before I came here what's going on with that unity government, if it still exists. I, I don't know, it's not clear to me. Um, and in terms of the Palestinian Authority, what was the question? If they're going to be able to go into Gaza. Right. Well, that's the dream. Right? That's the dream. Can Abbas go back into, and I don't see Hamas being like, here you go, you know, here's Gaza. You know, they've had their own little kingdom there, and they've been quite happy about it. So they've got to get something in return. Maybe some of these ministerial posts and some money. I don't know. Maybe, maybe there's a way to do a more of a shared arrangement there. So this questioner is actually asking about how Palestinians in Gaza feel about Hamas. How much support or distrust is there toward Hamas and its actions? Do Gazans openly question the decisions and strategies? Do they approve? So, I mean, Do over a certain time frame, um, I, think it's, I think it's split, okay? I mean, when I, when I was there uh, a couple years ago trying to do a story about how Palestinians have felt about Hamas's rule, like, you know, three years after they seized power there, you know, a lot of people weren't happy about it, right? I mean, they didn't want to be ruled by Hamas. They see, they see that the, they had the blockade and there were all these implications, right? Um, they're not religious. A lot of Palestinians who live there are like, you know, Hamas is fundamentally a religious Islamist organization. They're not, you know, they weren't too thrilled about it. Um, but always people were more upset with the Israelis, right, and Israeli policy. It was never like, I, you know, I prefer to be ruled by Israel or something like that. So, um, you know, and so it, it was never that. Um, and it's like right now in this current conflict, you're, you, you keep hearing that in Israel that, you know, well, the Palestinians in Gaza, they have to blame Hamas for this, right? And I, I don't think they all do, right? I mean, and, and I mean, you're seeing some now, and there was a story yesterday, I believe, uh, in one of the majors, you know, saying like, people are like, please stop firing rockets at Israel. We can't take anymore. How much... We, look what we were decimated here, right? So I think maybe you're seeing some turning. But remember, the elections in, um, in 2006 were, were very close, right? I mean, they were split. And so, you know, half of Gazans didn't vote for Hamas, right? And I don't think they've grown that enamored with them over the years. Yeah. So we'll stick with, with Hamas for just a minute more. Um, I have a couple more questions. So what role does religious fundamentalism play in this conflict? Is Hamas driven by religion, or is it politics? So it's a good question. I mean, I think it's, 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 it's a religious, you know, it's rooted in the Muslim Brotherhood, um, a, a religiously uh, Islamic um, organization. Um, but, you know, from what I could tell from my reporting in Gaza, they weren't, uh, like, they weren't mandating uh, broadly across Gaza, like they didn't go, they didn't seize power and, and make everybody pray five times a day, the way you're seeing like ISIS doing now in the area, like in Mosul, they, when they seized in northern Iraq, and they're like forcing people to be Muslim, you know, in the religious sense, or they're going to behead you. Literally, that's what's happening. Okay, so you know, it's different. It's not, it's not like that. Um, 
but they are religiously uh, motivated, and that, that was the split between Fatah and Hamas, right? One's more secular and one's more religious. So even within the Palestinian entity itself, there's dis disputes over this. But fundamentally, Hamas, while they want to be political and all this, they still see themselves a as a resistance movement, right? And so they want to resist Israel and Israeli occupation. So it's politics and religion. So this questioner is, is asking about Hamas's charter. It calls for Israel's destruction. So the conflict with Hamas is not about territory. Doesn't Israel need to manage this conflict militarily until the citizens of Gaza w want a different leadership? Well, here's the thing. Even if they want a different leadership, I, it's not clear to me how they're going to get there. I mean, I think it's a good point that we need a Palestinian election. Right, we haven't had one in a decade, right? So there hasn't been, we don't know. We need to like, you know, maybe we'll, that's something we could talk about, right? Um, but that's the way Israel sees it, that there's no negotiating with Hamas. Of course, as I pointed out in the beginning, they are ultimately right now. They don't have a choice, reluctantly negotiating with them. So, um, but as I also mentioned, I, I do not think they can solve it militarily. Okay, so, mm. so let's, let's move on or come back to uh, Egypt. I have a couple of questions about Egypt. And Egypt has been a broker for Gaza. How does political uncertainty there and its new leadership under General LCC impact Hamas? Will the blockade be tightened or are the conditions under which and are there conditions under which it could be lifted? Well, it's interesting because you had this war of Hamas versus uh, Israel, but one of the things that Hamas really wants is for this border crossing in Rafah, which is in the southern part of the Gaza Strip, to Egypt, to be reopened. And Egypt has no interest in that. They just, uh, Egypt just um, flooded 200 smuggling tunnels that were linking Egypt with the Gaza Strip. I've been in these tunnels, okay? And um, that, you know, I was there when, watching, it was a full-blown commerce where Hamas was um, exacting a, a le you know, a tax on these tunnels, it was a full, a full thing going on there, and they just shut that down. So um, that was uh, quite harmful to Hamas's finances and to their, you know, everything um, that they were smuggling in that way. So I don't know how they're going to resolve this. I just, it's, um, for me, stepping back, it's interesting that the U.S. is, is ultimately relying on Egypt. It's certainly where Israel's more comfortable. Um, but Sisi, this President Sisi, is no, uh, he's not like we are, right? I mean, if you recall, it wasn't that long ago that he mowed down a thousand people at a protest, right? I mean, he's not our ideal interlocutor. Um, but there's this idea that Egypt, it's this old romanticism that Egypt can somehow deliver and I don't know, the true, as I mentioned, the true power broker when it comes to Hamas is Mohammed Morsi who, uh, that's just the facts. I mean, it, it, they've arrested everybody from the Muslim Brotherhood, but it was Mohammed Morsi who got Gilad Shalit, the Israeli soldier, released. I mean, he was the one who was able to get Hamas to do it. So I don't know if they're consulting with him right now. I Probably not. <laughs> so just as a follow-up to that, this questioner asks whether or not um, Egypt may be in a position um, to do more in terms of the long-term peace process. Are, no, I don't United see it States. right now. Then the United States? Yeah. No. No. Look, right. here's the deal. Nothing is going to happen on the peace process while the U.S. checked out. Now, you'll say, Janine, nothing's happening while they're checked in. But I, there's a chance when they're checked in um, that maybe, but right now, and I'm not talking about Oslo in 93 when it really, oh, the US, you're wrong, Janine, the U.S. wasn't involved, it, you know, they did it in Oslo, but right now, I just, there's nobody, especially when Israel feels this isolated and hunkered down right now, that they're going to, they need the U.S. security. They need it. Even though they're fighting and with Obama and everything, they still need it in order for there to be a peace process. There's nothing supplant, nobody, no player right now can replace the U.S. as a mediator on that. Okay. So I'm going to shift to, I'm going to shift to the media now. Um, this questioner asks, both Israel and the Palestinians have accused each other of manipulating the media and reporting on the conflict. Can you talk about misinformation, the use of false images or old ones, and how this has affected a public opinion on both sides, or all sides, I should say? I don't know. I mean, I don't know about the false images. I know there were some early reports that, oh, that actually wasn't a, the... I don't know. I just don't know. I didn't see anything very extreme or blatant that wasn't actually 
happening in Gaza, where it was actually, you know, a Syria, th something that happened in Syria. I think there were some accusations about that. But um, I think what's interesting here in general um, was the way uh, that it was like each side was looking to the media for affirmation of their own victories, right, in a way. Um, in 2008, 2009, during Ca Operation Cast Lead, most of the foreign media could not get into Gaza. They just weren't there, okay? Then you had the 2012 operation, which was significant, but it was nothing compared to what we've seen now. And I think one of the differences in the extent of the coverage and the way you saw it and why you saw so much of it was because the entire foreign press was able to get in and, and through the Eras checkpoint and report it. So they were physically there. Um, reporting on what was going on there with obviously some um, horrific images. Um, and so there's a lot of accusations um, in Israel about, well, why didn't the foreign media uh, get pictures of the Hamas rocket launching? You did see very little of that, right? You didn't really actually see them doing it. Um, but these guys were not out in the open, right? They were hiding because the, the second they went out, they were going to get killed by an Israeli drone. So it was definitely challenging. And Tyler Hicks, I recommend you read what he wrote in the New York Times. You know, he's a Pulitzer Prize winning photographer. I believe that Tyler Hicks would have gotten that photo if he could. I mean, he like risked his life in Libya. He nearly died. So I think he's, you know, ambitious enough um, along with the thousand other journalists there. But so I think that the media, um, you know, we can talk more about it if you have more specific questions. But in terms of manipulated images, um, there were certainly different sides emphasize different things, right? But in terms of manipulation, I don't know how much of a problem that was. Yeah, so I think this questioner is getting at the, the question of emphasis. You wrote a piece in Slate magazine that focused on Israeli public opinion and, and how they access information about what's happening in, in the Palestinian territories, both in Gaza and the West Bank. So how do Israelis see this conflict and where do they get information from? And how does that affect the way that they view it? Thank you for the question, whoever asked it. Um, before this whole conflagration, you know, before it all started, I was saying, and I, and I, and that Israelis today are, in general, very post-Palestinian, right? If we're, if the whole world and everybody here is curious about and wants to understand the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, um, Israel wants to change the narrative about itself. Okay, so right here in the Bay Area in March, um, Prime Minister Netanyahu came here, okay? And he went to the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, and he met with Jerry Brown, and they weren't talking about the conflict with the Palestinians, right? They were talking about how Israel could help California with its drought, right? He wants to, he wants to talk about Israel in a way that doesn't deal with the, just wants to make it go away, right? Did not talk about it. Um, a few weeks before this started, I was sitting around the corner here with um, Israel's ambassador to the UN, who I know for a long time, reporting on this from Washington, Iran Prosor, who you may have seen on TV in recent weeks. And he said, I keep getting asked about the conflict, but I want to talk about how Israelis can help poor farmers in Africa and do demining and all this. So they, they really wanted to move beyond it. And I think that's why, in many ways, this war seemed for many Israelis to kind of come out of nowhere. Right? Like, they just weren't talking about it. And I've made this point, so I apologize, those of you who may have heard me before, but in the last Israeli election, it was the, last ele it was the first election where the Palestinian issue was not an issue. Right? The price of cottage cheese inflation, the inflation and the price of cottage cheese was a bigger issue, and I am not joking. If you go back and read the coverage of the 2013 election. So the country in general had sort of moved on. There's very little written in the Israeli press about... Uh, you know, these kinds of issues that you're asking about, sitting in San Francisco, like, what's the deal with Fatah Hamas re reconciliation? What do Gazans want? What is Abbas's health like? What, you know, what's it like to, you know, live in Gaza? There's just not that kind of stuff going on. The few reporters who do report on it are considered lefty Haaretz reporters, and they don't, you know, it's, oh, they do that, right? And, um, you know, I drew a contrast uh, in this piece I wrote for Slate about reporting in, in the in the Palestinian territories and, you know, being asked, you know, this woman came up to me, I remember it so vividly, and she says to me, you know, I'm reporting on something else, and she says, did you hear what happened in Israel today? And I said, what happened? You know, and she said, this guy killed his wife in a stairwell. And I said, how does she know that? Like, what is she, you know? So they pay attention, and I think more, and, you know, I think that's a problem. I think that the media, um, um, that there needs to be more exploration probably on both sides, but especially on the Israeli side. 
Yeah, so I actually wanted to ask the, the counterpoint, which yeah. is access to information in Gaza or in the West Bank, and, and where, where are Palestinians getting information, and how much are they, um, how does their view, how is it affected by Look, the reporting that they get? Yeah, everybody is, you know, first of all, Hamas has its own TV station, so that's one option. Then you've got, um, you know, sort of Palestinian official media, and there's certainly, you know, I'll give uh, Ron Dermer and Bibi their due. There is certain amount of incitement on these channels, right? But they also get CNN and everything. I mean, these are very, both people, you know, Israelis and Palestinians are very sophisticated people, right? I mean, they, everybody's got, I mean, cell phone service is much better in Gaza than it is <laughs> down by my house in Redwood City, I promise you. It's very, I mean, they're very good in terms of being able to access devices and, and communicate. Um, and I think this is, you know, we've got to talk about social media, right, in here. I mean, this is, um, and I'm sure, something that's on, uh, on all of your minds, and maybe I can use this question to talk about it a little bit. Um, this is another thing about, you know, when I said in the beginning, I asked my students what's new right here. Well, certainly social media was uh, a different element here than we saw in previous conflicts. I don't know if it contributed to a deep, nuanced, deliberate consideration of events. I think it became more of a, a way for people who care deeply about this issue to feel like they had some power, right? That they could somehow shape events by tweeting, you know, in some ways and things like that, you know, or tweeting a pro-Israel statement or a pro-Palestinian statement. And I don't even like using the terms because I think that they're empty and insufficient and need to be redefined. But, um, and so social media definitely um, is something, though, that I know the IDF has a whole unit that works on social media to try and use it now to, to get their point across. And you saw the same, I think, on the Palestinian side. Now, where I did have a problem with social media in particular, however, as a, now I'm putting on my, like, journalism teacher hat at Stanford, right, is when you had reporters in the field who were tweeting their feelings a little too liberally, right? I mean, I, I tell you, I mean, now I'm being more of a, a commentator and an analyst, and I, 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 but when I was in the field, like, I could never imagine tweeting anything but maybe my story so some people would read it, right? Like, I, I would never, I mean, some of the things you saw, so for example, you had that example of that CNN reporter who was watching the Israelis cheering as the, a small group of Israelis were cheering at one point while the military was striking in Gaza, and she tweeted, um, which say Israeli scum or something like that, scummy scum, and they were harassing her and stuff. The next day, CNN sent her to cover Ukraine. <laughs> so, I mean, they were, you know, I mean, it was, you know, but this was a, it was, you, there was a little too much emotion in that as opposed to sort of, you know, I feel there just didn't need to be that much tweeting from the field, I think, in a, such a fast-moving event. I'm not sure that serves an understanding of what's going on. Yeah, so, so in fact, my next two questions really, I, I think, drill home about this. Having reported on this region and this conflict for as many years as you have, is it possible to be an objective observer, an objective analyst, or does one necessarily have to choose a side? And this questioner asks, this is obviously a polarizing subject. How can and should we talk about it in a reasonable or a productive way? Those are good questions. There's two narratives here, right? There's two macro, I talk about the macro and the micro. There's two narratives, people looking at this conflict, right? Here's narrative number one. You have an embattled Jewish state fighting for its survival in a violent region with a murderous terrorist group bent on your destruction, ruling this, slip, this sliver of territory, and now they have rockets and tunnels that they can use to attack you. The whole world is against this little Jewish state no matter what they do just biased against the state, right? And Israel withdrew from territory in the Gaza Strip, and they got rockets, okay? So that's narrative number one, okay? Some of you might hold that narrative, right? Then there's narrative number two. Israel is the most major military power in the region, backed by the most powerful military on Earth, right? It's led by an extreme right-wing government that continues to reject peace by populating the West Bank with settlements and, and arresting people and demolishing their homes, and Gaza is a collective pr is a prison, and they, protective co they, pr they practice collective punishment, and um, you know, that's narrative number two in a nutshell, okay? Now you go into this as a reporter, right? And you got these people yelling at you with these two different narratives. I don't care about these narratives. I don't care, okay? This is your narratives, right? There's elements of truth in each of these things, okay? And it's important to understand the way people see it. But your goal 
when you're reporting on this story is just to find out what happens sometimes. Let me give you an example. Okay, see this? So this, sorry, this became my <laughs> three-year-old's art project, but it's relevant. This is a story from Sunday's New York Times, okay? And there's just a line here. Um, Israel was, uh, they were still carrying out military operations. There wasn't a, f a, a, a full ceasefire. They this is just one example of what I dealt with for many years reporting on the ground there, okay? So these two cousins were killed on a motorcycle. Let me just read one paragraph. The cousins killed on their motorcycle were identified by relatives as Abdul Hakim al Mosadar, 60, and Hani al Mosadar, 18. A spokeswoman for the Israeli military, speaking on the condition of anonymity under army rules, said they were, quote, terror operatives who had been targeted in a pinpoint attack. Relatives of the two said they had nothing to do with the resistance and were on their way to work at a family owned gas station when they were hit. This is the kind of dissonance over one set of events that you have every day reporting on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Every single day. I remember so many of them. You do the best you can, okay? And sometimes you have this very unsatisfactory formulation where you have to just give both sides because you don't know exactly, right? You weren't an eyewitness. You don't, and sometimes even an eyewitness event, people are disputing what happened, right? You saw that play out. So I'm going to shift to, to uh, opinion in the U.S. and talk a little bit about the U.S.-Israeli relationship. And this questioner asks, uh, polls show overwhelming sympathy with Israelis compared to Palestinians in the U.S. However, younger Americans are far likelier to criticize Israel than older. How is this likely to affect the Israeli-American relationship moving forward? This is a very sophisticated observation, whoever made it. Um, because when you did look at the poll numbers, yes, um, most of the uh, Americans during the, um, uh, the last month have blamed Hamas more than Israel. But when you break it down by age, that's exactly what you find, that it's a, it's a far uh, smaller number of, um, of younger Americans felt that way. So I think this is something that will be of concern to Israelis um, at some point. But right now, um, I think there's a certain amount of taking American support for granted. I don't know what else to call it. It's just assuming that it's going to be there. And I don't know if those numbers show that it will always be there. I mean, I don't know. This week, you've got a parade of potential candidates for 2016 rushing to Israel to go to the Western Wall. And you have Hillary Clinton, uh, I mean, doing flip-flops to assert her pro-Israel credentials. So I don't think this is an immediate problem. But yeah, I think longer term, that's a trend that's going to be worrisome. For people who want to see the relationship stay strong. So I think, I think you've noted, noted this in some of the comments that you've made in, in other mm -hmm. forums, but I, I wanted to come back to it. Um, the impact of the Israeli airstrikes on civilians in Gaza has drawn increasingly harsh criticism in the international community and even from the United States. Um, how much might this impact relations for the U.S. and Israel? And then a secondary question looks specifically at Europe. There's a growing antipathy towards Israel and rising anti-Semitism being reported in Europe. To what, to what effect will this have on Israeli security moving forward? Yeah, I mean, you had unprecedented verbal condemnation come out of the White House and the State Department after the um, strike on a UN school, which killed 10 civilians. There were a couple of UN strikes on UN facilities, but the last one that killed 10 civilians who were sheltering there, they called it horrifying, disgraceful. They said they were appalled. And they said, quote, the suspicion that militants are operating nearby does not justify strikes that put at risk the lives of so many innocent civilians. That wasn't, uh, you know, Qatar. That was the United States said that, right? So I think there was a certain amount of um, surprise in Israel with the strength of that commentary. But again, um, I think it's reflective of just how bad the, the, the relations have become between, it's become very personal between President Obama and Prime Minister Netanyahu, I think. Um, and the other question, and, and how this impacts, you're seeing the, Brit, the Brits are holding up arms sales to Israel right now. The U.S. with the hellfires today. I mean, the Germans who, after the United States, are the number one allies of Israel have been extremely critical. This is not limited, this criticism, when you have this many civilians killed. There's, it's not limited to some fringe, lefty, Israel-bashing divestment movement, right? This is like, uh, this is mainstream allies of yours are now criticizing you, right? And what was the last part of that that you want to ask me about? Oh, I think there's the anti-Semitism anti in Europe. Yeah. I'm horrified. 
I'm scared and I'm horrified on a personal level. I mean, we all should be, right? I mean, it's, it's um, you know, and there's this thing in Israel where they, some people over the years have, they say, you know, this is not about, on the one hand, they want to make it so Israel is the home of all Jews, right? And But on the other hand, they say to American Jews in particular, butt out, right? Let us manage our affairs, right? And there's a lot of tension there sometimes. And and I think that, you know, when you have an American Jewish soldier uh, from, from California who died in this war in the Israeli army, it does become about us. When you have anti-Semitism that's erupting the way it is right after this kind of Israeli military operation, it does involve American Jews and worldwide Jewry. So I think it's, it's very worrisome and, all, you know, I don't know what people are going to do about it. I mean, it's terrible. So in the interest of... of, uh, of asking the question on both sides, this questioner does ask, is there any way to determine whether or not Hamas purposely uses civilians to shield their weapons? So it's clear, I think, um, uh, by, from not only the Israeli accounts, but that the, a lot of these weapons have been hidden underneath uh, mosques and schools and houses and things, and they're going to be able to document that. Israel's going to be able to document that during any of these war crimes investigations. They sent out, they learned from the uh, 2009 war, they, they sent people. Um, well, I think where it's going to get trickier, though, is in this question of, well, okay, so what is a legitimate military target? And I'm not an international law expert, but this whole question of distinction and proportionality. So, for example, when Israel killed 18 members of the Hamas police chief's house, at the uh, whole uh, family in, in their house, they didn't kill the police chief. They killed the 18 family members. So I guess they, they were going after him, right? What is that? Was that a military target? I mean, these are the kind of questions that are going to be asked, I think. So I think um, in terms of uh, whether or not they were putting stuff in people's houses and things, yeah, I think they were. Do I think that all the Palestinians were psyched about it? No, I don't. Do I think they had power to stop it? No, I really don't, actually. I don't think they always had power to stop it. Okay, thank you. So over 50 UN resolutions condemning Israel for violating the Geneva Conventions um, have been made. The US stands virtually alone in supporting Israel. Is this in the interests of the US? What, that being a partner with Israel? Yeah. Um, well, I know that what Israel would say. Um, <laughs> Israel would say, like this T-shirt on uh, Ben Yehuda Street, which is the main drag in Jerusalem, it would say, don't worry. It says, there's a picture of an F-16 on it, and a lot of American tourists buy it. It says something like, don't worry, uh, America, Israel is behind you. <laughs> That's what it says. And um, the, there is a certain, I mean, look, right now, this dispute over the weapons that you're going to see play out in the next couple days about the hellfires and stuff, why is it playing out? Because the United States keeps its weapons for the region there. It's like the one safe place they can keep them, right? Um, for what they need to do, like with ISIS and whatever else, right? I mean, it's, it's like the store. I mean, it's a major alliance, and it's not going to go away, and, and nor should it. I mean, this is an important ally for the United States on all kinds of levels, historically. Um, and, you know, the whole idea of UN resolutions, I mean, that's, I mean, there's, there definitely, there is, with all of Israel's problems and all of it, the investigations, there's a disproportionate focus on Israel at the United Nations. I mean, that's just, that's just the way it is, you know. So I don't know if that should be the reason that the U.S., you know, doesn't become stay allies with Israel, I don't think. Well, so I've got some other questions about the U.S., but I, I want to I come back to a question which you wanted to talk about and we didn't really discuss yet, um, and that is how viable is a two-state solution at this point? Or I are to we, talk about it? Or, well, I don't know, maybe you don't. <laughs> are we at the point where a one-state solution is the better option? There's not going to be a one-state solution. I don't know. I mean, I don't, can't see it. What is, what is that? Binational state? Bina is that what the option is? I don't see it happening. Um, but um, but Tachlis, as we say in Hebrew, like, how do you translate that? Um, as a matter of fact, that may be sort of what it looks like, right, in the absence of a deal. So um, I, I don't see it happening. I'm, I'm worried about this, though. I'm worried that um, not only this facts on the ground idea, which is important, that Israeli settlements continue to grow, and then how do you divvy up the land? Okay, that's a that's a problem um, that I think is getting harder to solve, but can be remedied. I just I don't see the, um, 
anyone in, in Israel really speaking out in favor of pushing this agenda right now? There's a lot of skepticism after the second intifada in 2000 uh, erupted after the, the last serious peace effort under President Clinton. So, and, and the leadership in Israel is moving in a more right-wing direction. So I don't, you know, and as Israel is the, the main, the stronger party here uh, in the conflict, I, I just don't, I don't know how we're, who's going to get it. It's got to be, it's, it's not going to happen at least till 2017 when they're, you know, after a new president takes office. And I don't think it's going to be the first item on the new president's agenda. So we're really about out of time, but I want to ask one final question for which you can give us a short answer, which is probably impossible. Um, I can do it. I can do it. <laughs> so how will the Gaza conflict uh, influence region, regional dynamics? In the past, the Palestinian cause has been a focal point, whereas today other conflicts have really drawn attention away from it. Uh, Libya, Syria, and now in Iraq. And this secondary question, is the turmoil in Syria and the rise of ISIS connected at all to Islamic fundamentalist groups like Hamas? And does that help or hurt their cause? So regionally, there's some discussion that maybe this is forming a new alliance between Israel and very unlikely bedfellows like Saudi Arabia and, um, I don't know, some other strong states in the region that they who don't like Hamas. Uh, that Because, I mean, the Saudis actually have come up with some extraordinary language here uh, about this. Um, so maybe you'll see sort of a new shifting alliance there. But... Palestinian issue remains an important issue. Um, I think in Arab states, obviously, it's not the only or maybe the most important issue anymore, or the, but it's still an important issue with um, an, an ability to influence uh, uh, regional tensions. Um, I mean, I think Syria, what's going on in Syria and Iraq sort of, you know, dwarfs this. I mean, it's, I mean, Syria is a nightmare. We didn't even talk about it. We could have done a whole hour on Syria. Um, and by not talking about it, it's not because I don't feel that we need to talk about it. It just wasn't on the agenda tonight. I want to make that clear. In terms of ISIS, you know, one of the things, and I'll, maybe I'll finish with this, one of my big questions uh, in this whole thing has been, Israel was, they took out as many Hamas targets that, as they could, but they didn't try to kill Ismail Haniya, and, and, you know, they didn't try to kill, the, they didn't try to decapitate the leadership. And I think the reason, so I didn't really know what the goal was, right? It was to weaken Hamas enough so that they couldn't threaten Israel, but I think, this is my best read, keep it strong enough so that they could fight off more radical groups like ISIS-like militants. Mm -hmm. That was the best read I could come up with, and I talked to some people about it, and I didn't think it was crazy. So, I mean, there, Hamas itself is outflanked by even, I know this might be hard for some people to process, but by much more radical Islamist groups like ISIS. And when I look at the region, and, I, and, I'm, and if I'm sitting there looking at this, I'm much more worried about ISIS right now. I mean... Take a look what's going on there. That is a major, major crisis. So um, I think there's a lot of threats to be worried about in the region, and I wanted to end on an optimistic note. Um, anyway. I, so. I, that's not really an optimistic note. But I hope, I hope nevertheless, that I was able to uh, share at least some observations that might be helpful to you as you follow these stories in the coming weeks. Well, on behalf of the World Affairs Council, I want you all to join me in thanking Janine Zakaria.